All right, we're back. Master James, long time. Josiden, I had a nickname for. Oh man, I had another nickname for you. <laughs> that I was coming. We've got King Jonica. We've got <laughs> Josiden. That's a surfing reference to Poseidon. Isn't that what they call Laird Hamilton? Isn't that? His well, that was name? me saying he oh. was like Poseidon because I was sitting with him the other day in the water, and he's got those flank stakes for uh, lats. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, monster man. He just makes waves come out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will. Maybe next episode I'll remember what that cool, bro. new nickname was. Always appreciated. Um, Easty Boys. We've got the Easty Boys. We've got the uh, Saw Dudes. The names, nicknames. I mean, this Wait. is uncharted territory, so maybe that's why they just keep coming to me. But to Keep flowing. A couple Texans talking Gita. Um, yeah, the nicknames. So much fun to come up with. But uh, speaking of nicknames... The nicknames that I don't dig are the nicknames in the Gita where <laughs> there's like 108 names for oh, Krishna. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to keep track. Yes, trying to keep track to where I took time to take out the nicknames. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. In oh, a, no way. Just in a Google Doc for my own reference oh, wow. of all of the verses in English and then oh. taking out the the nicknames just because it's... That's something uh, I've always wanted to do, that all the names of both ways, all the... Yep, it's all both ways. I took it out both ways. All the Arjuna names and Krishna names. How many are... How did you end up with? There's 108 for Krishna. Are there something, really? Something like that. Because you know um, 108, right? No. I it might know. be 108 for Arjuna, but it was it was something like that. Wow. Well, if it's actually 108, that's fascinating. I mean, 108 is super sacred number in Vedanta. Why? Well, there are 296 Upanishads, and 108 of them are considered... Oh, like official. the official and of them 11 are the maho punishments it, it commented so every uh, uh, any authentic mala has 108 beads really oh yeah. yeah 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 a proper meditation mala that has 108 beads 108 is just like a the super sake it's the sacred number of of Vedanta. well as and an invest, would, as an investor sense. in open ai and chat gpt we're going to use the marvel of I was about to ask, did you Modern do it? Did technology. you use Chat GPT for it? Yeah, um, yeah. No, I didn't, but I, I did. Um, I did this maybe three months ago, but we oh. can't ask it how many nicknames. And then we'll also use the marvel of modern podcast editing to take and out I mean, the even, time of research. But. Even for, you know, DC East Coast people from the 90s, everyone will remember the, the straight edge Hare Krishna band called 108. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's see. <laughs> how many nicknames are there in the Gita for Krishna and. How many nicknames are there for Arjuna? It says this is based on it's. There are many translations. All this preamble of uh, there are many translations and interpretations. However, based on a broad estimate, Krishna is often cited with forty to fifty unique epithets, mm-hmm. while Arjuna has ten to fifteen unique epithets. Yeah, if it was one hundred eight, that'd translation, just be, that'd be too cool. One hundred eight for your future uh, time pass. Wikipedia 108 Hinduism. And okay, you yeah. Get some, there's, a, there's a lot more than I just said. There's, 108's a big number. Oh, awesome. Important number. Well, yeah, it seems to be <clears throat> 65 or 70 something. Yeah, there's um, a bunch. Well, the I will share that with you. And anyone listening to this episode can DM me on, on uh, Yoga for Your Intellect on Instagram, and I'll shoot it to you as well. Or By if way, you happen to know out there yeah. how many names there are for Krishna in the Gita, let us know. If you know the exact number, because that was actually a poor showing for ChatGPT. It's usually uh, really insightful with exacts, exact answers. But if you know the exact number, send us a DM and I'll, and I'll mail you a signed copy of Vedanta Treatise. Okay, wow. Someone, that's a big deal. So let's say it again one more time. What's the offer? If you know the, if you can email us the number and then we're going to go verify it and obviously it says with different translations might be off by one or two. That's okay. It'll still qualify. The first one to send in the right number yeah. for each Arjuna and Krishna, I'm going to send you a signed copy of Vedanta Treatise. It's sitting right in that box right there. Bing, from, bing, 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 bing. Yeah from swamiji himself that's awesome uh and whenever we do this by the way people answer um oh and it's a you know whenever we've given books away before yeah. we've given a t-shirt away before people do yeah reply in and uh and so i've been to the post office a handful of times for people claiming, actually claiming speaking of that just to mention i mean a lot of I, it seems like these days um i on the instagram uh channel Yo- at yoga for your intellect and uh, at yogafreeintellect at gmail.com, uh, 
a, every few days someone's writing in saying I'd love the Zoom links for the classes that yeah. you, that Joseph is doing and and uh, and they ask for other information. So that's awesome. It's happening. So so well, if you're interested, feel free to. We do read our our DMs and our mails. So let us know. And uh, and yeah, so in our Venice Vedanta Club, yeah. Donald Boyce is about to, uh, who's our resident several degrees in continental philosophy european philosophy uh friend here in, in venice he's uh gonna join your gita class oh he perfect me, yeah good, good good last night so it's he should he should it is, he'll love it yeah that's uh early morning we'll get him up early that's right Six thirty pacific the so yeah way off on the 108 um uh, but i want maybe it's maybe it is that number that just is uh is in my head from other references mm. but the uh yeah, the nicknames were throwing me off, so I was like, "Okay, I'm just going to spend two hours to figure it out. Nice, take them out, replace them, uh, because it's with the three-year course. Uh, it is amazing that it's essentially two years of the three-year course is going through what can be read in less than an hour in the mm. Gita. Mm. But in addition to the right way of reading it, and it's actually the right way of digesting, is not reading it. It's it's with a master teaching it. It's not uh, kind of like how we conventionally think of learning here, where you just read mm. um, and and you read through it quickly. Mm. It's it's actually so different. You don't read for information with this stuff. You read for transformation, which is you know two verses at a time for listeners. You know this very mm. well because <laughs> you teach it. <laughs> but uh, and then a lot of reflection in between, uh, much more reflection than than just info gathering but i will say it's also really fun to read through it um every once in a while mm -hmm. in one fell swoop mm -hmm. and pick up on kind of like the zoom out and then zoom in yeah um references for it's, sure so it's and i've loved it i've loved kind of going so i agree uh you know for all those years in the ashram every winter we would go to uh, at least one city with Swamiji and, and usually also Bombay. So in each city, he would do an entire chapter of the Gita over four or five nights. Mm. Um, just to, to back up your point, it was so fascinating because in the ashram and, and how we teach also, it's you know one or two verses in a class at a time, super deep diving word by word. But it was really great to go to those lecture series um, and as you say, zoom out and get like a whole idea of what all of chapter five is saying in five nights, you know. And, and um, so, yeah, even uh, more than that is what you're saying, stepping out and seeing what the whole Gita is saying in, in a reading. But, yeah, it, it is useful for sure to understand the broader um, context. Yeah. They, and by the way, we'll, we will we'll always use ChatGPT or a better reference if we're if like myself, if I'm making up numbers and we can check, <laughs> uh, we'll do that. And then Nick, our producer, will be able to chop it up for you. You'll get the, the accuracy uh, that sometimes only the internet can provide. Yeah. Instead of two guys chopping it up and, like in this case, making up that 108 number on, on my, my side. But the but interesting that that's the number you got. So it's come from somewhere. Yeah. That's uh, the, I, I can't wait to dive into why 108 is important. Um, mm -hmm. after this but uh, the the topic that I had in mind for our conversation today is around no preferences mm -hmm. and both the proper interpretation of that that high ideal and uh, Sanatana Dharma the highest ideals eternal ideals of Vedanta mm -hmm. another another word for Vedanta Mm -hmm. In English, could be highest ideals, mm -hmm. and to take kind of that exotic layer off of it and just say highest ideals that mm -hmm. you can write on a rock, look at, reflect at value systems, value system, and um, no preferences. Living with no preferences is a uh, is one that I find myself thinking about. Last night had uh, our five year old L um, woke up twice, was throwing up. Mm. Um, was just you know, really sick, food poisoning, and and also getting back from travel for two weeks, and you know just 
how a house looks after traveling for our nine days, how yeah. a house looks and feels yeah. and yeah. disarray or yeah. totally out of rhythm, mm-hmm. slight time change, especially with, with three little girls and no naps. Time change. It basically, it was almost like you're in a totally different universe for mm-hmm. a day or two until you find your rhythm. And then yeah. uh, added on top of that uh, sick child. And there is this, uh, the selflessness of the father figure. It's just like, yeah, we're doing this right now. And then there's also the selfishness of, man, this is really going to uh, get in the way of the day that I already, it's already busy tomorrow, mm. uh, coming back from travel. You just see these heavy preferences, yes. like a magnet pulling me away from where I currently am. Mm. And that distance of where I am in the bathroom, 3.30 a.m. Um, yeah. And where I want to be. Yeah. There's a whole lot of tension inside. So one of the things that, uh, a big thing I want to discuss with you is what is the right approach to, we've you've mentioned on the podcast before the, the old adage, the, the great way is easy for the one who has no preferences. Yes. What is the proper way of interpreting that? Because mm-hmm. I've also told you before, like, no preferences. Mm-hmm. So like Swami has no preferences. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh no, he has preferences. Yeah, yeah. You asked him. Yeah, I asked him if he has preferences. That was great. <laughs> he and, said, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah. can you help walk us through the yeah. ideal of no preferences and yet yeah. an enlightened soul can have preferences? Yeah, so where do preferences exist? In the mind. In the mind. Don't be a slave to your mind. That's all. It doesn't mean don't have a mind. Have preferences. Um, have a preference for, in, in any given, in, in, what you're talking about is, is much more challenging than whether you like this hot sauce or that hot sauce. You're, you're talking about like, I have a preference to be in my bed getting rest right now not doing this or preparing for my day or doing my spiritual sadhana in the morning rather than my uh occasional special duties as the gita calls them you know whatever it is it could be a child could, and the, and the yeah. preference wasn't necessarily like i don't want to be here with my child who's no. she's already out of the bathroom and i'm cleaning up throw up everywhere oh yeah yeah it's hardcore that, not yeah. like oh i don't want to be here with her yeah um yeah although that is the you know we should live transparently in that scenario. Even then, I'm like, she's going to be okay, but this is really going to wreck my day. This is going to wreck my yeah. day, yeah. So the mind has its preferences. Okay, put it that way. Even like how we would like the day to unfold mm. for everyone. You can have unselfish preferences also, likes and dislikes. You know, I would rather that uh, I would like it better if everybody was healthier in this way. Or I don't mean your family, I mean the world, you know, or whatever. Uh, those are fine. Some preferences are noble, some are ignoble, some are um, things you'd like to avoid, some things you would like to court. But understanding that these things are not our, in our control, that's the intellect. Understanding, 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 understanding. When we assess and and uh, have correct assessment of the world with the intellect and correct expectations to follow them, the assessment, then we'll we'll relate to the world correctly. And the mind still has its preferences about how things could go. It could just be like a group of friends go out to dinner, and how you would like everyone to sit, you know, or like you would like things to happen uh, a certain way. Um. Just don't be victimized by that. Recognize it. The intellect can recognize. Well, I, I would much rather like the day to go this way for myself, for others, for the world at large. But there are factors that are beyond my control, <clears throat> which is a lot of factors, in fact. You know, and relate to the world accordingly. You won't be, therefore, as I said at the beginning, a slave to the mind. That's all. We shouldn't be victimized by the mind. But it doesn't mean don't have preferences. So when you ask Swami, like, do you have preferences? Of course. I mean, he can tell you. I've heard Swami say, you know, if it was up to me, X, Y, Z. 
we did things that you guys would do this, 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 and this, and this. Talking to us as students at the ashram. If it were up to me, meaning according to my preferences, you guys would behave this way, this way, and that way. But that's not you, and that's not the world, so I'm fine, you know? Um, but in, in, in terms of specifically the example you gave it, there are regular duties he talks about in the Gita. <clears throat> Was it uh, Nitya Karma, I believe? Regular duties, regular routine duties that you are uh, required to do as a seeker, as a as a person on the path to the truth that you can't neglect. You know, waking up, studying, um, all these things that we do: Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga. There's also, I believe it's Naimitika Karma, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while since I looked at that section. But those are occasional special duties. So, um, okay, study is important, uh, essential. Um, making it to your work obligations is important, is essential. To pr- For what? To evolve, to provide for your family, to provide for the community, your employees, what have you. But, you know, if a family member calls you in the middle of the night, even one not in your house, and says, this, my fire at my house just burned down, I need someone to come pick me up, like, this is an occasional special duty. It, yeah, it, it wrecks your day, but you go, and you do what you're supposed to do. And then there's also forbidden actions, you know. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the Sanskrit, doesn't matter. But forbidden actions that we should never do, which are devastating to our growth, our evolution, spiritual. Which are those? Yeah, I forget the, exactly what they're listed, but it's all the a lot of the usual suspects of the the thou shalt nots, you know, from world literature. Um, lying, stealing, cheating, adultering. Which you know. text is this from? Gita. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's often said in, in Vedanta that there aren't any thou shalt nots and. Yeah. Shouldn't, uh, yeah. shouldn't, shouldn't. Yeah, offhand, like I said, it's been a while, that section, but the Nishadda karma or Vishadda, something like that. There are certain actions. It's, it's not like a list so much as it says, it just says there are certain actions that you should never do. Um, so maybe next time we can get back to our, our guests with the, the details, but... Um, The main point is to say that there are regular duties, occasional special duties, and uh, forbidden things. See, the thing is, the reason I doubt that there's like a long list is because it is subjective. I mean, what it's up to you, basically. Whatever you, in your life, according to your conscience, you will have a different list, right, of things you should never do. Than, than I will, than anyone else will. Each one will have their own list. Um, you know, for a person, the, the easy example is what you eat, you know. For a person who recognizes the consciousness in all beings and doesn't want to destroy animals and all that, for them it's a forbidden action. It will it will devastate their conscience if they go and eat a steak at the steakhouse. You know? Mm-hmm. So... Uh, yeah, it's not, um, I, I don't think there's a uniform list, but <clears throat> it doesn't really matter. Main mm-hmm. point with this discussion is regular duties, occasional special duties, and, and forbidden duties. Uh, so when an occasional special duty comes along, it may or may not be according to our liking, our preference. The idea is, we can recognize, wow, the mind really doesn't want to do this. Or the mind really wants to do something else and not be affected by it. So you watch it. That's the, the bottom line of Vedanta's objectivity, Sakshi Bhav. The intellect is that which watches it and understands, wow, the mind is really having a, a preference for something other than what is right now. Mm. That will keep you unaffected. <clears throat> from it i mean that's what i was watching happen in, in the middle of the night was wow mm. i my mind really 
it, it the spring is being stretched yeah 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 each additional minute it's challenging you yeah sure that's good it's great to watch to know what are the so if i recast it back to you that the adage of the great way is easy to the one who has no preferences it's not to have no preferences because that is human i mean we obviously need a certain air pressure yeah. else we don't exist true uh, or you know we'll die so you have a preference but to not be beholden to that preference that's it not be a slave yeah let it pass yeah like the weather and it's just sure. okay this is just happening and yeah and if you can cater to it um more power to you if if the world can be adjusted to to as i like to say take the mind for a walk you know, if the mind can be catered to in a way that doesn't distract from your larger purpose, then there's no harm in that. You know, if I prefer to go. If it doesn't distract from your higher, larger purpose. That's the point. <clears throat> High, larger purpose, higher duty, higher ideal. That's the thing. Then there's no, it's, in other words, to put it positively, there is no taboo against liking what you're doing. <laughs> you know, there's no taboo if the opposite of, you know, Dealing with uh, a sickness in the middle of the night, no one probably likes that, you know, um, for oneself or others. Um, the opposite is if if you are find yourself in a work environment at a place somewhere in the world that has you have a meeting and uh, there's a great point break outside and you notice that there's a south swell running and it's offshore and it's you don't have anything on the schedule for three hours and there's a guy's got a board leaning against it waxed up that he doesn't use and wow why this all works you know cool i love it when things line up you know and you take the board and paddle out and have a surf and get your work done perfect it, it's not like the vedanta saying don't do that because you like it mm. it's not saying that it's saying if that fits in and it's not messing up your trip and it's actually recreating you and making you able to get some exercise and whatever it is, just an example of something I know you might in, you might mm -hmm. quote unquote like, then you go along with it. You, you can't, you don't do something cause you're, if you get an upgrade on a flight somewhere and, and you're going to be rested better and that, that fits everybody's likes. I don't know anyone who doesn't like an upgrade. <laughs> So perfect. It doesn't mean Vedant. There's this. There's this sort of like whipping yourself idea you know, that we have to like to to not allow yourself to cater to your likes at all. That that's frustration. That that's not the life Vedanta recommends. But don't be victimized. If don't be agitated and disturbed and have your day destroyed if things don't line up with your preferences that's the point <clears throat> okay well, th and this is the real nugget of the conversation there's so much to ask here within this realm by the way even last night I, in that witnessing there was um there was witnessing there was there was very little objectivity at mm -hmm. least from where the healthiest uh intellect would be and for folks listening if this is your first episode one of the things that that we that Vedanta is maybe central contribution to a practical living is that you have a body, a mind, and an intellect. These are your three equipments to navigate the world. And the, the latter two, by your mind, everyone knows you have a body, obviously. We know that we have a mind, but the contribution to our awareness is that you have two inner equipments, the, the mind and the intellect. The intellect is doing that witnessing, cultivating that witnessing, that's watching the mind it, and it really was it really is like a rubber band just being stretched in the this this distance growing from where i am and this strong preference of where i wanted to be uh, that's and it's it's in, i mean a, a friend the other day was telling me the the meaning of the word shaitan which is the devil for mm -hmm. muslims is distance <laughs> amazing, um, and that distance that you know that desire they attach there's so many words that we could throw at it but the thing one of the interesting things was we you've told me before 
I don't think it was on the podcast, that one of the definitions of karma that you can think about is uh, essentially what heats you up that you need to work through to show you where there is work to be done. Tapas. Tapas. Tapas means austerity and maybe uh, etymologically means to heat. Heating. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah, it heats you up yeah. to show you where there's work to be done. Yeah, we'll say do some tapas means like do some work. Put in some to effort. To heat you up. To heat like, you up, yeah. Do that which is uncomfortable yeah. to show you, wow, yes. yeah. you, anyone can find peace and peace. Yeah. 81 degrees outside loading a car with yeah. kids. Yeah. Uh, that's all it takes to show you how little peace yes. you can cultivate on yeah. your own. Shows you where you really are to do your tapas. It brings it up. Mm. It brings up the <clears throat> the weakness and the attachment and the the preferences. Right and co- correct. Shows you where you are. There is a point in there has been a point in this uh, spiritual evolution, philosophical evolution, where I used to find the uh, irony of of the immense displeasure if something was going to get in the way of my morning study. Yes, I can relate. <laughs> and the, yeah. the irony of of that how of, funny that is yeah. right and it, <laughs> it, it reminds me of the the in uh robert persig's zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance when uh there's a little anecdote in there where a man is searching for truth truth knocks on the door man opens the door and shouts don't disturb me i'm searching for truth right and so there's there was early on in in the path this this witnessed irony of like Fuck! Oh, I'm not gonna be able to get to my yeah my study. morning study. Yeah. Now it's almost like at three thirty, it is shifting things around that I don't want to be shifted around. But it it is almost like just cracking open the Gita to a certain page, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, this is the mm-hmm. this top is. Or I just I think about that that phrase that you're saying. It heats you up to show you where the work, mm-hmm. uh, where there's work left to be done. Where it's like, oh, that's that's my study yeah yes like that's it not that's your practice i would say okay so that's my so there is that happening within that witnessing which is yeah um it frustrates your mind on purpose it frustrates your like so the stretching you you were describing of like i can see my mind stretching more and more it's going to pop that is the desire building up that's being frustrated so this is what tapas does it heats up that way it denies your mind all the preferences the likes and dislikes the attachments the things that it's used to uh i've heard you say um pacify like a pacifier Mm. the things we use to pacify ourselves like a pacifier it shows you all that so so like when people come to the ashram not everybody some people have a hard time (laughs) but most people uh, for like a week or two they're like oh my god this is the most amazing place it's so peaceful it's so wonderful and it is especially if you've been like on the grind of your work and you know going to the job and cooking and cleaning and stuff and then you come to the ashram everything's done for you it's sweet it's great it's nice peaceful place birds singing sun rising all that i usually say stay a month it's kind of my standard answer. Stay a month. Then it gets hard. Because then the desires of the mind, the attachments, they start to, as you say, stretch. They build. Then you're doing tapas. You know, then you're that point you're doing tapas. <clears throat> and uh, the idea is to keep that, that stretch going in life, you know. Like uh, how 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 much can I do away from my desires mm. without snapping that band, you know, or without completely frustrating myself? Oh, I was cutting corners and cleaning, mm. trying to get back in bed. Yeah. And it sounds like you're saying, no, that's not, be careful with that of. Yeah. Yeah. Don't trying to do it, do everything I can to get out of that scenario. Correct. Yeah. Do the work, be in the effort. Intense work is rest. Mm. Ultimately, what happens is the heating of tapas burns up the desires, burns up the seed of desire, so that next time it's not as strong. Mm. 
This is what happened. This is the true value of the heat that happens. You in that desire, the desire is not in that effort. The desire is not catered to, and it gets burnt up. It gets offered, as it were, like yagna. You know, the fourth chapter of uh, the Gita. Um, Jnana, karma, sannyasa, yoga. The renunciation of action in wisdom. So you renounce action, meaning desires, meaning vasanas, all those things that lead to action. You renounce them in wisdom. In wisdom means by offering them to that higher thing. So in this case, uh, the higher thing is uh, my duty as a leader of my family, as the father, and you know, I have a duty. So that's wisdom in this case. Conquering that desire for sleep. I'm not saying don't get enough sleep, but just to make it like a higher and a lower thing for the mm -hmm. sake of discussion. In doing that, you become <clears throat> that attachment to the sleep, that preference for the sleep gets weakened, gets, mm -hmm. gets lessened. You master it. It doesn't mean if you have a good, a good morning to sleep, sleep, but you are not as victimized the next time because you have renounced that action in the wisdom of the higher, which is the goal, the ideal, the, mm. the you know, do your higher duty as, as a family man. The, I would love to know, uh, okay, so three things that I'm going to ask you, and I would love to chop them up one by one. One is, is there, you said, you know, take the upgrade. You got the upgrade. Yes. Who wouldn't take it? Is there a point at which the indulgence in preferences is a womb of sorrow where you're just actually like, be very careful because there's a cost to that. The world of the world is opposites kind of approach. Yes. The second thing I want to ask is, uh, and we'll chop up that one first, but then I also want to touch on um, this notion that once you study it enough, life just becomes the Gita. Mm hmm like life just becomes Vedanta. I think, it, and I can't remember which sage said it, but open your eyes and the universe teaches you Vedanta. Mm -hmm. um, that is fascinating in its own right to where you just, you're watching this tapas happen. Um, yeah. And, and then third is I want to go deeper in how to cultivate the right approach because that desire to get away from it, um, Sounds like the exact opposite approach that, that you're saying you shouldn't do. Yep. But first up, is there a womb of sorrows, um, which is a, a, a Swami quote, when you bend your life into desires. Yes. So is there a womb of sorrows with preferences? Of course. In fact, the second chapter, he talks about two types of, of self-control. One is not acting on likes and dislikes in the first place. Which sounds contradictory, but I will clarify. Number one, don't act on likes and dislikes for self-control. Number two, end perception with perception. Don't create further likes and dislikes from your contact with the world. Okay, tell us more. So, <clears throat> as we said, our actions should be driven by our intellect the mind has got to be always governed like a toddler like a three-year-old a three-year-old has got to always have eyes on it somebody's watching it otherwise it's immediate danger right five seconds a child's by themselves anywhere unless they're asleep you got to be careful and you guys all put cameras even right for a three-year-old when they sleep you got to watch them mm -hmm. so the mind has got to be constantly governed number one and led by the intellect like an adult governing the child but if what the intellect has chosen for the personality to contact according to whatever the higher goal the higher purpose the mission is in that hour that day that month whatever if it if the mind is going along with it naturally that's what i mean when i say it's okay if you like it that's all. So it doesn't matter if the mind happens to like what the intellect has decided to do. 
you can still go on so long as it's still driven by the intellect. Likewise, the intellect should decide to do something even if you don't like it. So that in that way, the intellect is leading. Sometimes the mind likes, sometimes the mind dislikes. Now, ultimately, sure, you get to a point where they're so the power of your likes and dislikes are so faint that it, it takes almost no effort. You know, the intellect, you just your whole life is based on intellect. It's just what should I do next? What should I do? What should I do? What should I? What is my obligation? But realistically speaking, as a human being, you will have likes and dislikes. So nothing. Why torture the mind unnecessarily? That's the point. You know, we at you asked the self-realized man in front of me, and in, do you have preferences? He said yes, more than you, <laughs> because he's been around the world. He's got such refined. Uh, he can tell you which is the best chocolate in Switzerland. You know, to which street to go for the chocolatier. I mean, you know, but the life isn't driven by that. That's all it's saying. Nor should it be driven by what I don't like. The intellect should decide this is what I'm doing today. And you may notice, oh wow, the mind's really in a good, has a good feeling about this. It likes doing this today. That's good. And you go along. But a highly self-controlled person is unaffected by that completely, whether the mind likes what it's doing or not. And I'm, I, this is... Uh Maybe, or it is presumptuous, but is it is there a case of you see the world as opposites where you're like, yeah, this ice cream is enjoyable on one level, yeah. but every extra bite, yeah, is having its own cost. Oh, for sure, associated to where awesome, they almost yeah. just neutralize it themselves. To where yeah. this is objectivity, and this is what people realize about like if you're smart, uh, the chili peppers. Blue, you sit so pretty west of the one. Sparkle like yellow diamond, just a mirror for the sun. Let us check our heads and let us check the surf. Staying high is more trouble than it's worth in the sun. You know? Mm. Californication. Shout out. Talking about our ocean. You know, staying high is more trouble than it's worth. So even that, like, I don't mean just like people using intoxicants, but any type of Oh, dude, it's a, so, well, that, when you say upgrade, yeah. once you taste first class or oh, yeah. uh, business class, oh. that's an expensive It's very womb. expensive. It, You've entered. It, oh, it's tough. Yeah, it's hard to go back. But um, trying to even maintain certain mental states, all of this cult of our happiness, you, you get above that. It's not about happiness or sorrow or joy or sorrow or inspiration or not inspiration you do what you decide to do now it's not about feelings everybody is so about feelings you know i don't feel you know i don't have enough of this chemical in my brain or that chemical in my brain and how do i you know an intellect driven person sees their own mind like the weather it's the weather mind is the weather feelings, emotions, likes and dislikes, all the weather. It just doesn't drive you. That's the that's the point. So number one, self-control is not to be driven by likes and dislikes. I don't feel like it today. I don't have enough mental energy. Eh, get up and do it. You know, that's that's intellect. <clears throat> so don't be driven by likes and dislikes, number one. Type of self-control. Second one is not to create further ones by ruminating upon that upgrade. I got upgraded. Here's a selfie of me. And then you tell everybody and you start researching upgrades and then you start looking for upgrade deals and you, you, everything's about that upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. You've created a whole new powerful like and dislike at that point. So he's saying you're coming with likes and dislikes for sure already in this birth as a human be objective to them don't act directly on them and try not to create further ones which what your point is brilliant to say as you're contacting something understand the futility of it 
reflect again and again, varam varam, he says in the Bhajagovindam. He reflect again and again, even this shall pass away. There's nothing lasting in this. But what is, I want to get to the permanent, not the, all these impermanent things. So then as you meet life, you don't get carried away in anything. Because mm-hmm. then that's the real womb of sorrow. It's not just one contact to the next. It's the whole buying into this world itself as something real and and uh, worth pursuing, worth working to maintain. That's mental involvement. We're all completely involved in the world. We believe everything is real. Nothing is. We just got to find our own self. There's nothing else to do. That's it. So then you use that intellect to get on to that message of Swamiji's that I'm quoting. Mm-hmm. Thanks to you. What listen, a, what a message. This morning. Every day. It's, a, it's, it's fixed on my week. It's a secret that we can't tell anybody. Yeah. The, <laughs> and if you do get that message, um, then you're a lucky one. Uh, the It'll land in your lap. Let's put it that way. Uh, if you get it, it was a, a voice note that Swami sent sent me when I was actually requesting these books um, for for folks. Does yeah? There seems to be. So I I noticed this band stretching last night, and it was already stretched because of preferences that are, that were already stacking up. Of like, okay, the house is in disarray. Um, going to get lack of sleep or just going to be off time because of uh, uh, sleep schedules and uh, uh, Marley, our uh, middle child, two and a half year old, um, had just peed on, on the floor um, and you know had no nap the, the first time that that uh, L threw up. And so it was already, that was, you know, that was before we went to bed. So 3.30, it was already stretched. But it was contained. There was this sense of the 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 healthy things. The unhealthy thing was noticing, wow, this is getting really stretched, hmm. and just noticing that the mind was getting really stretched, which was reaching a breaking point. And and it seems like the unhealthy thing was trying to reduce it with uh, by running away from the battle, you know, instead of being like, no, go into it right now. The healthy thing was witnessing it. The other healthy thing was uh, that I noticed was thinking like, every, so I've, I'll open up the Gita just to a random verse. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful. It's, you know, in the 700 verses, it's just all about navigating the world. Yeah. It is so relevant. So relevant. Anything that you're oh, thinking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. And it is, it's like wrangling, you know, uh, taming a, a tiger in your mind, being the tiger. You're always next to an untamed tiger. Mm-hmm. So a text on how to tame it is always relevant. Mm-hmm. So it, I've noticed these same things um, where on a, the plane ride earlier in the day, th- all three were crying. Two of them were crying. Uh, and and uh, it's almost like, oh, this is, the, this is the verse that I'm opening up to. So it's a really fun, healthy thing to now, you know, a few years into study just to be like, oh, wow, this is the Gita. This is the the chance to develop. I'm at the gym. Sweet. No commute. No issues parking. I'm already here at the gym mm. to uh, to work out. And that orientation to what you're saying of of almost preferring to be there to a certain extent. You know, yeah. that was at 2 p.m. on the flight. Yeah. 3.30 a.m. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm ready to leave the gym. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. There, there is that reorientation that's beautiful to where there's almost a preference for that, just like yes. what we've chatted about before, where there's the preference to be at the gym because Correct. of that wiring. Yeah, because you know uh, that you're, you're getting an opportunity to work against those, um, the individualizing attachments in the mind, mm-hmm. which is by definition difficult. I mean, by definition, power, danger. So in the Upanishad, he says, may we have a hundred years of karma. That's in the Upanishad. 
She's like the contemplative, pure, high text of just thinking about the self all day and meditation. He's saying, let us have a hundred years of karma. Mm. Karma means working in tapas, in a state of putting aside your likes and dislikes and serving a cause and letting yourself cook in that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, after a while, correctly, well said, it does become preferable. You start to look forward to opportunities to put yourself out, as it were, for the a larger cause, a larger... Um, there's liberation from your own mind and its own demands, your own desires and attachments and likes and dislikes by serving something beyond all of them, beyond your own selfishness. So yeah, it's a great, a great opportunity. And and it's so there was that healthy aspect of it, um, and I, I do love that imagery of the of heating up because you feel heating up. Yeah. But instead of avoiding <clears throat> it, it is, um, you know, it is. It's a chance fire to exercise. Is purifying, yeah, right. You know, it's good for you. Um, and that there's almost a a desire for those moments uh, within within whatever the limitations of the mind of my mind you know can only handle so much but yeah there's um and these are all so low on the totem pole of of the suffering out there but it is still interesting it's you know but it's how it should be these contained things in the gym like you Mm -hmm. obviously yeah Mm -hmm. they're heavier weights but yeah uh, maybe you can't lift them at that point these were you know testing limits but in a really uh almost entertaining way Mm -hmm. um I also knew that if I got frustrated by it, this is where knowledge is so powerful. I knew that if I got frustrated by it, it would spike my cortisol. I wouldn't be able to sleep for 45 minutes yeah, afterwards. True. But if I stay calm, just knowing that fact that when we get frustrated, um, spikes are stressed and, and uh, annoyed, agitated, spikes your cortisol, and then it takes about 45 minutes. Hmm. to go away and then you can fall asleep so that was it was almost just that knowledge it's like yeah don't indulge this frustration amazing amazing um, which by the way i know when i pull the ripcord on my agitation mm. there is a there is almost a mental it's like my mind says no we're going to unlatch this fence yeah and let it let it out let it out which actually it brings me to this this other observation uh this other healthy observation where you've said before once you're almost like walking to the fence to unlatch it and let it out it's too late yeah it's too late it's gonna happen it's gonna happen like if you think you're containing yourself from saying something to yeah. the spouse in a fight it's four minutes away from being said yeah it's, like it's, it's already too late but yeah. um but to cultivate the lack of desire to say that yeah Hours before the fight, sure. Uh, b- before the fight even happens, you have yeah. no desire to say it, right. and that brings me to this other healthy observation that I had already built up like eight and a half, nine hours of sleep for six days in a row. Mm. So I had this surplus mm. that I already knew I was kind of working with, mm-hmm. and it makes me. It made me think of all these things we're going, you know, cleaning up, throw up. It was actually really, you know, was, you're you going through all time, this. Yeah, to, <laughs> to think about this stuff. But, um, and it's something that you had said before of um, Swami telling you once to not gamble. Yeah. Like you're, you said, well, any, I, I, I can't remember the exact specifics, but it was something like any advice for me when I, I'm oh, heading back home. Don't take a risk. Don't, don't take, take risks. risks. Don't, don't take, take risks. risks. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take risks. Yeah. It was so, it's such a Swami moment. Yeah. I was leaving and he had just given a lecture and I was leaving India from on that trip. And it's always fascinating to see what he says because it's always digital. It's, it's like chat GPT before <laughs> chat GPT. I went to him and I was just like, Swamiji, I'm leaving. Yeah, just any advice. Don't take any risks. I mean, just instantly. Yeah. I'm like, you, I look at him like, what made him say that? Does he think I was going to take a risk? I don't know what, but yeah. anyway, don't take any risks. So go ahead. Yeah. And that, that came to mind and, and <clears> kind <throat> of, or it has, that has rolled around in my head for, you probably told me that um, almost a year ago. Yeah. But yeah. it rolls around in my head. I guess I, uh, like I'm prone to do, like the 108. Mm. I had a different version in my head of the gambling. 
of don't gamble. Um, Same concept though, yeah. And not like don't go to the casino, um, but more of, um, but more of what you have in your hand. Don't take it for granted, mm-hmm. and don't throw it away. Yeah, because you're saying no, no. I really want twice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in business, especially startups, mm-hmm. that's what you think you're doing when you're doing it wrong is gambling. Yeah, mm-hmm. you think you're you got chips on the table and you go to the roulette table and you're like, let's go bigger, let's go bigger, uh, until you go bust and you realize, man, the best poker players are not gambling. Right, they're playing a process. Mm-hmm. to where they just know the odds are and they have experience where they will win because no one else is playing a process. Mm. It's so oh, it's basically they're the ones doing the least gambling in the entire house mm. uh, versus the ones at the, you know, the roulette table, the blackjack tables. Mm. Um, and that I think about that when I'm laying out mm-hmm. my day Mm-hmm. When I'm like, no, I can do one night a week where I go out till 10 or 11, but that's it. Because mm-hmm. it's a real risk yeah. if I do two. Yeah. And something unforeseen happens, mm-hmm. like having to get up multiple times in the night. And then it's um, three. Exactly. And then you're flipped. And then you're flipped. And uh, and so there was this other healthy observation of, man, I got a lot of surplus in the bank to handle this hmm. scenario versus how I probably lived my life with, without kids mm. um, 10 years ago. And I was right on the edge, never had a surplus. Everything mm. was being risked mm-hmm. and gambled for mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. I was selling everything hmm. to put it on the metaphorical roulette table and, and thought that that was this is how you build a startup. You put everything on. I mean, it's what we say in mm-hmm. our conventional language of put everything on the line. Yeah, everything leave on the everything line. Out, leave sure. everything out there on the field. Sure. Huh. Yeah, that's the mind. The mind is unfillable like fire. Mm. It'll keep saying more and more. So those are the healthy <clears throat> things, but um, but it still was certainly... And here was the where the, the two other parts that I wanted to dive into this equation. The scenario one was uh, okay. So the right approach. This is where I was making the mistake. Was um, my mistake was how do I get out of this? Mm, right. You're resisting. I want to stay calm, but I want to get out of it. Yeah, you're resisting the duty. Right. Instead of plunging, plunge. Keep plunging. That's the way. You got to go through it, not out of it. The way is through it. Dude, that's me at the gym too. <laughs> I'm there and I'm like, I'll do two or three, four things. Yeah, yeah. Then I can for go. For real. And then I can go. Yeah, I know. It's tough. The gym is tough. Push. Push through it. Ultimately. Then you get the, the duty is done. And that, is a greater satisfaction mm. than evading it. Than nine hours sleep. Yeah. Doing the duty is where the satisfaction is. Not from uh, not doing it. Satwik happiness is acting, doing what you ought to do without preference, without attachment to the fruits. Uh, rajasic happiness is happiness that you get from contacting an object or being according to your like or dislike. Tamasic happiness is that skipping school. Fourth period when we used to skip our Gertha Jackson's typewriting class in DC. Shout out. <laughs> She's listening. I don't know. I doubt it. But oh my god, it was such a kick to sneak by the the security officer and make a run for it and go sit in Tasty Diner and drink coffee, you know, but you know, somehow we got away with it. We, we all ended up okay. But it, that skipping school feeling, mm-hmm. I'm not doing what I have to do. There's a kick at first, but it's uh, in the long run, you end up, you know, as Swami says, you know, working and not doing anything successful in life because you skip school. <laughs> you know? It's bad. That is bad. <laughs> but as you're talking, I'm like, 
<clears throat> and I, n- I never really skipped school. Yeah. But, wow, did I. Did I. Minimize effort. Minimize my <laughs> effort. Yeah. And, I mean, I prided myself until like sophomore year of college that I never opened up a textbook. Yeah. Like I would say that in the, I don't know, four life scenarios when I could say that with, in some social uh, situation, you know, with pride. I'm, I actually never opened up a textbook. And I minimize that effort. It's like me going to the gym. Mm. But there's this, uh, yeah, so it sounds like that is, you're leaving a lot on the table when you do that, to continue the gambling metaphor. You are. You're also allowing the, you're acting, you're doing, you're doing the opposite of the self-control points made earlier. Number one, you are acting on likes and dislikes, therefore strengthening them, mm. therefore further defining the individuality and the ego and the personality and all that. This is what I am, not this. That's one. You're acting on likes and dislikes, which is bad. And number two, uh, encouraging further, which is the same thing. You know, encouraging further strengthening of the mm. by by avoiding what we don't like to do. So. Yeah, man, it's like, it becomes, I mean, just before I came over here, you pinged me and you're like, hey, I'm ready. And I was in the kitchen. I mean, was, I'm not a saint, but in this case, I, I'll pet myself on the back. <laughs> you know, I, I make, I, I give in all the time to mind and intellect and uh, to the mind to likes in, in different ways. But there were three or four dishes there. My coffee cup was still in the, in the sink. My AeroPress was uncleaned. You know, and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm on my way out the door. But I looked and I was like, ah, I'm in a hurry. I don't have to do the dishes. I stopped, turned on, did the dishes just because I saw the mind go. I'm getting away with one. I, right I'm now. getting away with one. I, I have a good excuse not to go do the dishes. You know, and James is waiting. and <laughs> mm. Do it. Just do it. You know, I don't have to clean this wetsuit. I don't have to clean it every time. Do it. And it's almost like a game. And after a while, you're like, oh, caught your mind. You know, I mm-hmm. see where you were trying to evade effort. So that's what it is. Like, in any. And then do you relish that on a certain level where you do go back and you wash the dishes and you're like, nice. I did the dishes. Yeah. No, there's a satisfaction. It's, a, it's just a simple sen- a sense of having done what I ought to do fully. And we all know the difference in those days. Mm-hmm. A day where you just nailed everything you were supposed to do. You did what you ought to do. And you're sitting on your porch having a cup of sweet tea in the summer sunshine of Texas. It's like, mm-hmm. I did what I ought to do. Nice day. Now I can sort of be at peace. And on that's on a, a day-to-day level. Imagine that on a macro level. Imagine you get to a point in life where all the desires are dealt with. All the ignorance is dissolved. You've you have fulfilled your cosmic ultimate obligation to know the true self and reside in consciousness, and there's not a stain left in you. It's uh, this is the this is the ideal self realization. That's it. It's it's the end. Instead of drawing down from a surplus, just everything is just adding infinitely to an infinite surplus and you're done you get to a point where it tops it tips over it goes from you know 99 percent perfection to infinite okay so walk me through the <clears throat> what would the uh so you mentioned sattvic uh rajasic tamasic those are the hierarchies of of high-mindedness we could say and sattvic being the highest minded approach to something what would the most sattvic mind or individual witness and cultivate in that scenario at 3:30 what is that inner dialogue if you were to jump to this is how a master would and not even a master but let's just say someone extremely evolved philosophical how would they observe this if mine's somewhere in that in that middle ground, some healthy things and some really unhealthy things, uh, the the mind would be at total peace. 
in a total stance of, of witnessing. They would be watching the uh, uh, gunas function, watching the equipments act like you would be watching a television show. There, there would be no, probably no commentary at all of, uh, inside. It would just be recognition that, oh, the personality is not in the sleeping state anymore. It's now in the waking state. The hands are, are, are doing something on the floor of this room. <laughs> and then the, there would be no involvement mentally whatsoever in a sattvic person. Total objective witnessing to it. That's just it. this is uh, doing, I am doing I, I am I am I am the self I am consciousness I am the unborn reality I am the supreme truth I am supreme godhead this guna is functioning these these equipments the gunas All, almost in third person James is functioning James is up cleaning now you have nothing to do with it. You said, no, the highest sattvic person. That's the highest view. Identify with your true self and function in life. And uh, in the Gita, right, he says, to him whom uh, a piece of gold, a piece of mud are the same. Mm. So <laughs> to him whom sleep and waking are the same. To him whom uh, these changes of life are just nama rupa. Different name and form. That's it. It doesn't. Uh, it's a change of scenery. It's a change of the external uh, fractal pattern that he's viewing. That's it. So no value in in any of it. In any of it, either way. So no difference between uh, Vedanta podcast time uh, and uh, cleaning up throw up time. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> the. I will say that with that, with increased knowledge, it becomes, those become, like we're saying, one and the same, where it's like, right. oh, wow. Right. This is, this is more real than reading a chapter and verse off of a page of it depends. the Gita. Yeah, they're just different, um, they're different functionings. One is an intellectual ex ac level of activity at the intellectual level. One is a activity at the physical level one is more s sense involved one is less they're, they're, they're just action they're all the world of action that's it and in that that vein of um you have preferences but not beholden to them i guess i conventionally was thinking there would be the inner dialogue and commentary on oh this is not my preference but I think you're taking it um, very helpfully in a in a higher level where those are not even yours. There are preferences. Yeah. With this James. Correct. He has preferences. But they're not my preferences. Yeah. And one is not, you know, air pressure at a certain level yeah. and air pressure at a different level are to someone watching a movie, it does not matter to them. Mm-hmm. And there is no inner dialogue or commentary on this isn't, yeah, that's a helpful, uh, elevated, just version that I had in my head of, of, I almost always just thought the witnessing and commentary were there mm. instead of, now you get to a place where there is no commentary. It mm. just. Yeah. No, it, nobody's home. That's that word. So when we ask Swami if he has preferences, and he's just a. Uh, if I can project, which I never should, but anyway, why not? He says, I have preferences. He, that I is not, what he is, we don't know. He's just talking to us as a human because we're two humans asking him a question about a human. You know, and he, it, like he's catering to our, our question, basically, our level. Because we're looking at him as a being that's sitting there in, in a body. And we think that's him. And he's like, okay, yeah, I have preference. But that I is not stuck to that personality. That I is infinite. That's a self-realized person. So mm -hmm. a sattvic person is one who is very much identifying with the infinite I, the true I. 
not the per not the one that's in a personality and the trans sattvic person is swamiji or any other enlightened self-realized soul uh, any other means once in a generation not not common but mm. <clears throat> but a sattvic person is is uh, much closer to that than the rest of us, let's say. Mm. So they they will be in extremely quiet inside. They won't even if apparently excited or apparently dejected or anything. Mm. Deep in there is nobody home. This has been super helpful. The uh, yeah, the, I feel like the episode should be called the the path to no preferences. Yeah, that'd be uh, great. But uh, you'll have to remember the episodes and maybe, um, I don't know, 20 years from now, you should send it to the girls and just so they appreciate right. you. Man. I know what Joel, dad did for me. And <laughs> Jolie, you, uh, you're, um, what did you do? Last you, yeah, your I want to say excretion was, uh, was a lot of tears. Oh, so everybody was contributing uh, on, last yeah, night. On yeah. the, uh, uh, not, it was on the, the flight. I'd say um, 20 years. Let them be like, you know, starting to work and stuff. <laughs> right. And yeah. No, and and it's all. <laughs> I almost felt. I I uh, hope that well the the goal is for them to listen to these twenty years from now. Be amazing. So, uh, well, that'd be amazing. Yeah, it's uh, Marley. I feel bad telling the world that you peed on the ground, but it's all good. We all did it. We all did it. Um, uh, to to have a little bit of a cliffhanger for folks for next episode. Something I want to ask you uh, in the next episode is when you're in one state, deep sleep or sleeping state or waking state, do the others exist? <laughs> so we'll get to that next episode. That's a big cliff. Yeah. Looking forward, man. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, brother. That episode was fantastic. And if you are digging yoga for your intellect and want to introduce this philosophy to your coworkers and your team, well, Joseph and I are down to come visit basically an in-person YFYI. Come visit with you and your team. In the same way that you might invite a yoga instructor for a team building event, we're willing to come to your office and talk to your team as well. We can do it over Zoom as well. It is, uh, it's whatever makes sense, but uh, we're even down to do it in person. And that is just in line with the mission of making this philosophy available and accessible to all those that seek it. Joseph and I would love to come talk with you and your team about Yoga for Your Intellect. And that really comes from my perspective of running businesses for the last 15 years and just knowing, man, it was about 10 years ago I was running 50 person company led to a trip to the ER is drinking seven cups of coffee a day to try to stay on top of everything. Um, trip to the ER with a heart condition. Needless to say, it was a very, very stressful, extremely stressful time in life. And that business ultimately failed. And 10 years later, I sit here and, and get to have these conversations with with Joseph while running two companies and and a venture fund. Each day just feels like it's a hot knife through butter. I have not had a single day of stress in the last six, seven years of building multiple companies and, and multiple venture funds. It's truly remarkable and I know that it's not me or the businesses that are different than 10 years ago, but it's my approach to each day and quite literally to the start to the day because every day starts with this philosophy for me and we want to share it with your team. For me, it feels like an obligation of sorts and a loud siren saying that teams and companies around the globe need to hear this. So if you're interested, email us at, this is the key thing, email us at yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. That's yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. Use the email address in the show notes and we would love to come chat with you and your team. <laughs>